know Galen uh, has COVID, so he is, uh, he'll be up on the screen for the verses because he wanted to do those. Um, and then Paul uh, texted me this morning and he wasn't feeling well. So I uh, hope that no one else has, uh, has COVID or anything like that. We want to be real careful about all that. Uh, thank you, John. We really do. And I'm glad you guys are here. Um, we're going to make some phone calls this week to make sure everybody's okay. But, I'm, uh, but let's, uh, let's have a prayer together and we'll, and we'll begin. Father, we thank you for today. Um, we thank you for a beautiful day. But more than that, we thank you that we get to meet in, in Christ's name. Father, I pray that your spirit would come down upon this place and be our teacher. Um, Lord, as we anticipate as we anticipate great things in our relationship with you. Father, we need you. Uh, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'll also say that Jennifer is on her way back to Texas, or excuse me, Louisiana. Her father uh, had passed away. Uh, we're not talking about Aubrey, which is her stepdad who kind of raised her, but her biological father passed away, and uh, she was able to go down and be with uh, him before he passed, and, uh, uh, but nonetheless, real hard time for her. She's going back down, I, I'm, I think, for the funeral, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right, Amanda? Yeah, I know she's going to set it up, and then probably have the funeral Yeah, so uh, nonetheless, uh, but she had a lot of peace because of his own salvation, but just wanted to let you know about that.
70s stuff has never left me. Hey, I, we want to recognize somebody for a moment. Um, um, some, what, what we try to do is remember once a year those who have passed. And uh, as far as I know, as far as we know, there's only been one. Her name is uh, Minnie Ruth Osmond. And uh, she attended here from the time that she was uh, 12 years old until she was 95 years old. And uh, she was one of those that uh, uh, she had become a teacher and, and different things. But she was one of those that remembered poems. And she could remember poems all the way up until she was 95. And she could just quote them off the top of her head. You just ask her about one and she'd quote it. And, just one of those brilliant minds. And uh, nonetheless, we're going to, uh, I'm going to go to light both these candles for her. Uh, and we'll see uh, just in honor of her. Uh, and uh, we'll give thanks uh, for the life that she gave uh, to her family and to uh, her church and to the Lord. Um, so we're going to also at this point, we want to uh, take communion at the same time. Um, I wanted to read here in Revelation uh, chapter 1 and verse 5. And it says this, uh, at the end of that verse, it says to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us to be a kingdom of priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. And so what we're doing this morning is celebrating um, a love that's forever. And so that's what we're doing today. Let's uh, partake together. Father, we needed um, this blood being shed for us. Um, there's not a perfect soul in this room, nor on the planet. We needed help, and you gave it. Father, thank you for washing away our sins and cleansing us. We pray this in Jesus' name.
Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, and even those who have pierced him. And all the people of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am Alpha and the Omega, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. And it said, Write on a scroll what you see, and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Teatro, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. You see, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. You see, his feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing water. And in his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun, shining in all its brilliance. Well, when I saw him, I fell at his feet, as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And now look. I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now and what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, and of the seven golden lampstands, is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches.
seated. Um, I'm pretty much uh, uh, always been a, a one issue voter. Uh, it's funny because I someone told me that I was, and my immediate response was, well, no, I'm not. Uh, as I thought about it a while, I thought, well, I don't think I am, but it's okay if I'm accused of being one. Um, there are two issues that I think that we must continue to pray for. And that is uh, for the life of the unborn and liberty, uh, religious liberty in this country, and for that matter, around the world. And so I want us to pray for that as we look toward the future is uh, life for the unborn we would be a, a people that would protect those who have uh, not been born yet. So let's pray together. Father, we come before you and we want to acknowledge, uh, we want to acknowledge Christ here. I realize there may be fewer here today. Um, I pray, Father, that you would speak to every person that is connected to this church. But not only that, but for those who are part of many of the churches in this town, that there would be a stirring amongst us, that there would be a devotion that would be unyielding. Father, I pray for the unborn. I pray that we would become a nation that would protect them. I pray that we would uh, be a nation that would be jealous for worship. That we would care about you. That we would care about uh, the honor of Christ above our own name. Father, we pray your blessing upon this day. For those who are watching, for those uh, who are here this morning, I thank you for their faithfulness. May your anointing be upon each of us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I have all of you are so kind. You know that I was thinking I needed some water. Thank you. That, how cool is that? Uh, take this medicine that every once in a while just sort of dries me up all of a sudden. Uh, we tend to emulate what we focus on. I've watched our uh, political leaders, I've watched them argue and fight, I've watched them say things that uh, you wouldn't want to be said around a child. And I've watched the people of this country argue and fight over things. Um, and I've seen how that it's uh, caused a, such a, a deterioration in relationships in our country. 
We rarely have statesmen anymore, people who have integrity. We're at a place now where it's time that we uh, would get on our faces before the Lord. Because uh, we are moving very quickly toward a, a system of government that is uh, not only godless, uh, but is uh, ungodly. Um, this morning, I'm, I'm wanting us to stop, and I don't know about you, but I, I deliberately didn't watch a lot of news. Um, I saw early on that it was bringing um, such a turmoil within my own heart to watch so many things. I certainly saw that uh, what seemed to be right to me um, was not being honored. And yet I also believe that Romans 13, that whoever is in, whoever's in leadership is established by God. And if we rebel against that leadership, then we are rebelling against what God has done. The Christian has to respond differently to what's going on. I hope that you are discovering that within government, there is no Savior. There's no Savior. Um, and so, the only way that things can change is that it simply begins with me, it begins with you. If you pull up the passage for me, Brent, I'm not sure I even gave it to you, but it's 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Verses 16 to 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 to 18. I want you guys to see something here. It goes like this. Whoever anyone but whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Thank you, Brent. And so, I think that as a church, as we stop and we look at him and we just stare at him, we can begin to change. But it's not until he becomes the focus of the church that the church will ever become what he intended. The passage that uh, Galen read, I thought it was interesting. I, I don't think he was actually able to change his voice like that. Do you? Uh, but that was pretty good. Um, he, uh, what you notice there that I think is significant is that God's intention is to be in the center of the church. His intention is to be the, uh, the one supreme in the church. And we 
find in the, in the chapters following there in, in Revelation that God threatens to take away the candle out of the church at times. It's when uh, men and women are no longer recognizing him as authority and when they are allowing things into the church that have corrupted the church. And so when we take our eyes off of him, the church begins to radically change. God's intention, his full intention, is for us to be like him. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 3, the Bible says that, that when we see him, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And that's what we want. In Proverbs chapter, uh, Proverbs chapter 8, we're not going to turn there. But it's a real description of what Jesus is like. And he is the one that's called wisdom. And wisdom is calling out in the streets. And this wisdom of Jesus is displayed as one who loves truth. Loves the truth. Is whatever is the truth. Is tell the truth. He's the one who hates evil. Um, he hates pride. And we see this in Proverbs chapter 8, and, it's, and, and Jesus is considered our wisdom. And so let me share with you four things before we actually look at those uh, things that are described in Revelation chapter 1. But I want us to think about, if you were to think right now with me, if you were going to resemble Jesus, what would it look like? What would it look like? Um, I wrote four things down. When I think about Jesus and looking at him, we need the perseverance of devotion in the face of rejection and standing alone. We need the perseverance of devotion in the face of rejection while standing alone. In other words, it's like this. Uh, there are people who can stay loyal to a church and yet not have devotion. They remain because that's what they do. But you see, what we're finding today is that even in the midst of this COVID, and I do believe that there is reason for some to remain home. I do. I think there's reason. As it escalates, I think that people have reason to do so. I believe that they're justified in doing so at times. But I also think, I don't know this, I think there are those who are staying home because it's a good excuse to stay home. Um, I learn all the time that there are those who don't go to work because they have COVID. And um, they don't have COVID, but they like to stay home. <laughs> um, what is it that would cause you to walk away from the church? Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 4, he said that he said, he said that he was left alone. He was left alone and uh, everybody forsook him and Satan was after him. And he said, but the Lord stood with me. His devotion was to the Lord and it wasn't to, uh, it wasn't to an entity, it was just simply to the Lord. And he was going to remain 
In Hebrews chapter 12, and verses 2 and 3, uh, the scripture says, Let us fix our eyes upon Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. The author and finisher of our faith. He says, you guys haven't resisted yet unto blood. And so what he wants us to do is to keep your eyes upon Christ. If you're going to keep your eyes upon a man, you're going to have problems. But if you can keep your eyes upon Christ, you can finish the race. Because he's the author and the finisher of our faith. So if you, if you watch him, what do you see? What are you looking at when you watch Christ and him alone? The second thing that I wrote down is this, that we need the spiritual wisdom of Christ in the face of deception at levels we have never imagined. The deception is going to be so great uh, in these days that you will need no, nothing less than the, the spiritual wisdom of Christ in the face of this deception. Matthew 24 says that if it were possible that the very elect or those believers who belong to him, if it were possible, they would be deceived. And I'm convinced that there are many that are going to be deceived for a while. There are those who believe and they love God and yet they'll be deceived because the, because the deception is so real. In 1 Timothy, if you'll look over there in chapter 4, 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse uh, 1. 1 Timothy 4 and verse 1, it says, The Spirit clearly says in the latter times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits things taught by demons. Such te teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. They are so convinced and they are so convincing. What I'm saying is this, is that as believers, we look at Christ and we want perseverance and we want perseverance of devotion. We want the spiritual wisdom of Christ in the face of deception. Isn't it amazing how you can have people right here in this country? I don't know exactly what the numbers are, but say 70, 72 million people vote for one person, 73 million or whatever it is, vote for another. And there are believers on both sides of that. There is deception. There is deception. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm convinced that as we go forward, that Christianity is going to shine and it's going to flourish and there's going to be an experience of fullness like we've never experienced before as we go forward. We need the deep conviction of Christ in a culture that changes with the wind. I remember a friend of mine, he would just be jumping on every bandwagon that was out there. He would jump on the bandwagon of uh, that we could be perfect. And I would remind him of Romans chapter 7, and then he would change his mind. Uh, so many things are out there. So many deceptions are out there. There are those who, who would say to you as a believer that they're okay with with abortion in certain cases. You don't have to agree with me, but either... Either we believe in the sanctity and the sacredness of life, or we don't. It's just that simple. It's that simple. 
It's not very kind, maybe, and to some, but it's not simple. Um, in Ephesians 4, I want you to notice what God's intention is with the church. Verses uh, 12 to 14, I want you to see this. Um, it says this uh, in Ephesians 4, 12 to, uh, uh, let's see. Let me skip down to 14. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head that is Christ. God's intention for the church is that we would develop such deep convictions about what we believe. I got to tell you something. There are, there are times, watch this, I'm, I'm going to confess this. And there are these, uh, these ideas and there are great men right now that have given in to some of the teachings of the world. I'm talking about men that have been preaching for a long time and men who have a places of leadership and authority in major denominations. And they've given in. And i got to tell you, there are times, there are moments that I have, there are moments that I have and I think, you know what? It would be easy just to go ahead and just give on that and just forget it and then just keep preaching Jesus. And then whenever I allow that thought to run through my mind for about a minute, Think, man, you know what? I couldn't even sleep at night if I did. Because the opposition is growing stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. <laughs> but I love what the future holds. I love what the future holds. <laughs> I do. Because his presence is going to be so full, ladies and gentlemen, as we face the darkness. That's coming as we face it. In Acts 2.25, it says, I saw the Lord always before me. Watch this. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. I'm going to keep hanging on to him. We need the kind of not only the conviction and the wisdom and the perseverance of devotion, man, we need a unique love. I want you to listen to me for a moment. We need a unique love that covers sins and yet restores the broken and the rebellious. Look at 1 Peter 4, 8, and then I'm going to refer to Galatians 6, 1. Look at 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 8. Notice what it says. I really like this verse. It says this. Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. In other words, um, this person just sinned or this person just sinned against me. It's not their lifestyle, but it's what they just did. Love sees beyond it. But there's another kind of love that needs to exist. I mean, it's really, it is, it's a beautiful thing to love people with all their stuff, isn't it? Galatians chapter 6 says this. It says, Brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual shall restore him gently, but watch yourself or you also may be tempted. The word caught there is a good, uh, a good word to translate that would be someone who's addicted. Someone who's addicted to a sin. In other words, we don't, we don't just excuse stuff. We don't just say, 
you know, it doesn't really matter. But what we do is we love people enough that we sometimes have to confront stuff. Are you guys aware of a, of a, of a passage in 1 Corinthians 5 where a guy was having sexual relations with his stepmother, uh, his dad's wife? Do you know what the church was doing? They were rejoicing. They're rejoicing in it because apparently, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing, that they're rejoicing in God's grace. And Paul said, what are you guys doing? You guys are crazy. What are you doing? He says, don't, don't, don't associate with people who live like that. And so they disassociated with it. And what happened was, and Paul says this in Thessalonians, he says the reason why you do that is so that they'll want to come back. You disassociate. And so that's the way we live. We live in such a way that we condemn no one. We can't condemn anybody. But we have to love someone enough that they're trapped in a sin and they don't see it. To carefully, carefully, gently, humbly bring them back. When you look at the Lord, what do you see? What do you see? I see perseverance. I see wisdom. I see conviction. And I see a, a different kind of a love. It's completely different. Notice when he comes back, he's going to come in the clouds, and the clouds no doubt represent the glory of God. There were times when, when his glory would set in the tabernacle that the people had to come out because it was just so amazing. It was so awesome. The Bible says that in Zechariah chapter 12, that when Christ comes back, that, the, that, that those who, 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 who wanted him to come back, they're going to weep. And they're going to weep as one who had killed their own child. And God says of himself here in Revelation, he says, if you'll look at it with me, he says that he's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. God becomes known through all language, all languages, he is supreme over all of the entities that exist, all the other things that exist in their descriptions. He is known and he is greater than all of them. The lamp stands, the stand, as he stands in the midst of the lamp stands. He is there in the present, and the lamp stands represent the church and its power. He's that high priest who's interceding for us, even as we, even as we, uh, as we are here this morning. His eyes are flames of fire. He sees everything that's hidden. Everything is completely bare before him within the church. His feet are of brass, fire and brass, which represents. His authority over sin, his authority as the one who judges. The voice of many waters that I'm not sure if that's what uh, Galen was trying to do, but nonetheless, it was one of absolute authority. The seven stars, probably the leaders within the church, angels also means messenger. And it says that he had them in his hand. He had them in his hand. He controls the leaders, or he is to control the leaders of these churches. And, as, and the, the two-edged sword, which is no doubt the word of God, 
No doubt the word of God that penetrates to the deepest part of our very souls. And he's also the protector of the church. Dallas Holmes sang a song called, I Saw the Lord. And these words are this. The place was white as snow and pure as finest gold. It had the look of new, yet had the look of old. I felt like I was home, but felt so far away. In fear, I thought to leave, but felt the urge to stay. And then a silence fell like none I'd ever known. I stood among the millions. I stood there all alone. His face was like the sun, his eyes were like the sea, his voice was like the thunder and rolling through eternity. And I saw the Lord. He was high and lifted up and rightfully adored. And I saw the Lord and he saw me. And then from sleep awakened, I looked into the night, the darkness overtaken by a bright and shining light. I couldn't understand it. I couldn't reason how. And then my eyes beheld him. I wasn't dreaming now. And I saw the Lord. He was high and lifted up and rightfully adored. And I saw the Lord. And he saw me. There's coming a moment in time that will last forever. As it were, if we're in this body, we're going to fall to our face. Because he is so good. Because he is so holy. And it's going to be a love we've never known before. And we're going to want all of it. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for your word. Thank you that uh, you have shown us yourself. I ask for your favor upon everyone that's here. I pray this in Jesus' name.